Yes, Mr. Thank you for, lunch. Um, thank you for the uh, time of the lunch, my, my Lord. Um, I've not been able to address, I'm afraid, the additional points that arose prior to the adjournment this morning, but I've spoken to my learned friend, Mr. Coppel, and suggested, for example, obtaining the additional article of the judicial review. But I anticipate we'll be able to do that tonight, and I, my learned friend has no objection if I were to interpose at the start of uh, tomorrow morning to come back on those points. Thank you. The court is happy with that. Um, well then, in relation to the challenge to the 2nd of February 2021 report, the decision is at pages 417 to 424 of the core bundle, uh, right at the end, tab 19C. <coughs> and the first ground of in relation to this matter is the allegation that the judge was wrong not to have found that the uh, ombudsman had failed to take into account an obviously material consideration in deciding whether the council was at fault, namely the findings of his honour Judge Jarman. Can I just uh, <clears throat> clear my mind on one thing? Um, if the court were uh, against you, no, if the court were with you on the, on the <laughs> <laughs> thinking too hard, if 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 we were to come to the conclusion that uh, there was no power to withdraw first report, but the first report was flawed and therefore the judicial review should succeed, then it might be that one couldn't immediately proceed to the second report because it was made at a time where the first report hadn't yet been quashed. But the parties s seem to be proceeding on the basis that if that's how the, the first grounds fell to be decided, then one would look to the second report, notwithstanding that it was made <clears throat> at a time when the first report was in existence, uh, and uh, treat that fact as irrelevant. We would quash the first report if, that's, if that were the right result, and we would then consider whether the second report should stand, and if it stands, it stands, rather than it having to be quashed in any event. Or us having to consider whether section uh, 31 to A or whatever it is would, would apply. So, 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 can, can we proceed on that basis? Well, my, my Lord, I was proceeding on a precautionary basis that the court might conclude that, and therefore I needed to address the second, I, I, I will address the second report, yes. whether or not what the proper relief would be, as your Lordship says, is probably very sensitive to the findings that the court might reach combination of findings that the court might reach but my lord I, I I will address my submissions on that basis if I may just reserve the right uh, at least provisionally to argue that, that it would be proper to leave the second report standing even if it had no in error inherent in it itself beyond having been made at a time when it ought not to have been made because there was no the, the, the first report hadn't been quashed if you want to express well, you are wrong I'm taking that well, I was going to say, can I keep my proud and dry and take <coughs> instructions on that? I will address, I, I, for the purposes of my submissions, I can address it on the basis that your Lordship's outlined, but it, um, I, I would need to obtain instructions on it. Well, I think, speaking for myself, I think it's a point that it's, it's for you to take. Yeah. It was part of your challenge to the second report, and I don't know whether it's open to you on, on, the, on, the, on the grounds, but in any event, you'll come back to us on that. Thank you, Lord. So, so in relation to that, the, as I said, the report, the, 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 the uh, reasons begin at page 418. The first paragraph of importance is paragraph 2. What we have investigated, the Ombudsman says, we have investigated whether there was fault in the exercise of council administrative functions <coughs> when it retained the fee after declining to determine the third application so far so good, consistent with the revised complaint. But then says this, we've not investigated the reasonableness of the council's actions, in parenthesis, presumably in 
its decision or its, it, 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 uh, uh, in, in retaining the fee in the context of the judicial review any previous planning or any previous planning commissions for the reasons explained at the end of the report so it is clear and i think entirely common ground that the ombudsman by february 2021 considered solely whether there was maladministration or fault in the council refusing to return the fee after it was requested to do so after his honor judge Sharman's judgment but refused to or declined to, to consider the question of fault in the context of those findings by his honor judge Jarman, notwithstanding that as the judge also accepted and this is paragraph 104 of a judgment that that had been an integral part of the complaint relied on by the council you see oh, it's a page 157 in the core bundle Paragraph 104, the judge said, I accept that Pell indicated in its correspondence with the LGO that it relied on the first of these matters, the Jarman judgment, by way of context, which deals with other matters. And then further down the page, over to page 158, similarly, the Jarman judgment was relied on by Pell for the impact it was said to have or should have been treated as having on the rejection of the earlier planning applications and whether it was appropriate for the council to rely on those rejections to refuse the refund. And then gives reasons why she says that the, the, the ombudsman's approach was accept, acceptable. But before I turn to what the judge said about it, if I could just go back to what the ombudsman himself said about it. As I say, he simply says in paragraph two, we haven't considered fault in the context of his origin Sharman's judgment, the judicial review. The reasons are at the end of the report. That can only be a reference to the paragraphs 46 to 48 under the heading parts of the complaint that we did not investigate. And we see there in the first paragraph that the Ombudsman, notwithstanding everything that had gone before, was still asserting that the complaint or the, the, the complaint about the refund was put on the basis that his Honour Judge Jarman's judgment implied that the previous planning decisions were unlawful and therefore should be discounted as void, with the result that no power under Section 78 to decline to determine the application could have arisen. And The Ombudsman goes on to say, refers to the clarification of the scope of the complaint in paragraph 47, but at paragraph 48 goes on to say, we've considered the issue of the refund as a standalone administrative action. We've not reached a view on the reasonableness of the council's actions in the context of the first planning application, the two planning applications, because our jurisdiction prevents us from determining the legal status of those applications. So drawing the threads together, paragraphs 2, 46, 47, and 48, the Ombudsman said we are not we're only con we're not considering whether the council was at fault in the context of the Jarman judgment because in order to do that we would have to determine whether those uh, planning decisions the the, the 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 first two the decisions on the first two planning applications were void that involved a number of errors firstly that wasn't what the complaint uh, the appellant was complaining and secondly, about or, or was suggesting the relevance of the decision was, and hence it was not necessary. The reason given, we can't determine whether those decisions were void, was a bad reason. And if I could take your lordships to the relevant pages to show that. Firstly, uh, within the, if your lordships could take up the supplementary bundle. <coughs> revised or clarified the scope of the complaint oh, there, there is email dated the 2nd of March 2018 from 
uh, my instructing solicitor to the ombudsman. So which page are we at? Uh, page 52, my lord. So this is in response to the first draft decision, which says we're not investigating this because we'd have to look at whether the decisions are null and void. Par the fourth paragraph, beginning, the complaint simply <coughs> relates to whether it was unreasonable of the council to refuse to refund our client's planning application following the court judgment. The complaint therefore relates to the council's action after the judgment was issued, i.e. refusing to refund the planning application fee, despite knowing at that stage that a high court judge considered their errors during the previous application to be unlawful. Whether the court judgment that the council acted unlawfully in the way it determined the previous planning applications means the planning refusals are null and void is not actually relevant. It would be relevant if, we, if the, our clients were claiming the council acted unlawfully and declined to determine the third application. This is not, however, the basis of our client's complaint. <coughs> relate, the complaint relates to the uh, re refusal to return the planning application. And then there is reference to uh, an opinion which I provided and which was disclosed to the Ombudsman, uh, which is which begins on page 56, going over to page 57. And if I could direct your Lordship, my lady's attention to the paragraph 4 and this discussion. So, so there's concerns turn on misconception about the complaint. The number of complaint <coughs> isn't as the draft decision suggests that the council had no power to decline to determine the third application because the decisions on the first and second applications were automatically null and void. On the contrary, the submissions in support specifically disavowed any reliance on that argument and a quotation from the additional information provided with the complaint, i.e. there was a power but not an obligation to decline to determine the application under section 70A. Section the subparagraph one is no longer relevant because that deals with the whether it was reasonable to exercise that section seventy eight discretion which was abandoned. But subparagraph two over the page is relevant. It is in any event it was unreasonable for the council to refuse to exercise its discretion to return the fee for the third application once it was requested to do so following the, the court's judgment by which point it could not reasonably dispute that the first and second decisions had been tainted by the appearance of bias. Not that they were null and void, but they were tainted by the appearance of bias. And then five, no need for the ombudsman to determine whether they were null and void, just has to decide whether there was maladministration in any of the respects described. And then the remainder goes on to deal with the question of alternative remedy and whether it was reasonable to expect <coughs> uh, um, the appellant to resolve to it. So how did the judge deal with this? This is, uh, if we go back to page uh, 158 in the core bundle. The remaining part, paragraph 107, we read, I read a moment ago the first part of it. For this, so this begins on the top of page 1457. For the same reasons, the LGO was entitled to regard this, i.e., the impact of the Jarman judgment on the council's discretion to retain, retain or refund the fee. I'm so sorry, where are you now? I'm sorry. Well, at the, uh, on the last line of page 157, so the judge has said, acknowledged that the, that the appellant relied on the Jarman judgment for the impact that it, should, that it had or should have had on the rejection on, on, on the rejection of the other applications and whether it was appropriate for the council to rely on them to refuse to refund. But the judge says, for the same reasons, i.e., as she's already said, the same reasons that they're entitled to discount the previous applications themselves. The judge was entitled to regard this as a legal matter, or at least inextricably linked to the legal matters raised. That's the first reason she gives. But, my Lord, as, as, as I've just shown, that isn't what the... Um, the, 
the, the, that isn't what the ombudsman did. The ombudsman rejected it because he thought he was. It required him to make a finding as to whether the the um, Charman judgment had the implication that the first two dis planning decisions were null and void, <coughs> and they were and the, and they were wrong about that. That wasn't a matter of discretion. It was a simply a misunderstanding of what the complaint was and the relevance that the uh, appellant said the Jarman judgment had. <clears throat> the second reason given by the judge is that she, in her view, the council didn't refuse the, the um, refuse to refund the fee because it failed, because it um, didn't agree with the judge's conclusion. And although that's, as I say, firstly, in my submission, the, uh, in error, because it wasn't for her to construe the letter. That was a matter. It was for the ombudsman to decide whether the manner of that decision was faulty. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt my, my friend. So that we, we've had extensive to and fro about the grounds of appeal in this case, and this is not one of the findings of the judge which has ever been challenged in the grounds. In the, it's in the skeleton argument at paragraph 89. The reasons given by the LGO for why he couldn't take it into account were plainly by them, particularly was wrong to think it would mean him having to determine the legal status of the decisions on the previous applications or indeed any reason at all. All he had to do was take account of what his Honour Judge Jarman had determined. He was not entitled to regard that as a matter of reports or some of which his jurisdiction prevents him from considering or inextricably linked. Um, I'm sorry, my, my, my point is about the judge's construction of the council's reasons for refusing the fee, which I understood now my friend to be seeking to challenge. Uh, that's, that has never been challenged, and it's not in the grounds. Well, the, the, the ground of a, the relevant ground of appeal is that the, the judge the overarching ground of appeal the judge was wrong to conclude that the decision to dismiss the complaint in the February report was unlawful. There are then particulars given of specific uh, points, including it was the judge was wrong to conclude it was unlawful. It was lawful for the ombudsman to consider the complaint without regard to the finding of his honour Judge Jarman. Um, my lord, I accept that this specific point isn't uh, isn't articulated there, my lord, but it is embraced within ground four A in my submission. The re the grounds of appeal don't have to state the reasons why the conclusion was wrong. It's stated that the judge's conclusion was wrong, and the reasons were articulated thereafter. If we're on paragraph 108 of the judgment, there's also paragraph 109. Are you going to address that one? Yes, I will, my lord. I mean, my, my lord, I've, I've, I've just taken the court to the emails from my yeah. solicitor and the opinion, which made clear that the, 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 the claimant absolutely in no way um, suggested that the complaint could be disentangled from 
is the impact of his honour Judge Jarman's judgment. It said it could be disentangled from the question whether the it was lawful or reasonable to decline to determine the um, the third application. That is what it said. It disentangled the question of whether the, it was lawful or reasonable to decline to determine the third application. But it what it what it absolutely put front and centre throughout was that the subsequent refusal to return the fee was maladministrative or faulty because of the way the authority had uh, failed to take into account or not taken into account properly the judgment of his honour Judge Jarman. And the way the judge deals with it in paragraph one, one eight is to say, well, it's, it's, it was open for it was open for the, which is in principle it's open for the ombudsman to limit what he considers exercising his twenty four a six power, but he has to do it for valid reasons. The reasons he gave were not correct; they were based on a misunderstanding of what the complaint was, and so he did not give any valid reasons for why. The, um, why he should not take into account the impact of the judgment on the issue of discretion or the exercise of discretion to re refund a fee. He may have reached a conclusion that it had no impact. He simply did, he, he declined to address it at all. And so he did, in my respectful submission, plainly leave out of consideration something which was obvious material because it went to the heart of the complaint. And instead, what, what in what in practice, what in, what in fact happened was that the complaint was completely recharacterized as as the decision itself says as a standalone complaint about a refusal to return the fee. And then it was looked at entirely through the prism of the council's retrospective defense that it had no power to do so, when that bore no relation to how the complaint had been dealt with or that the request had been dealt with at the time, as we saw before the lunch adjournment. The council didn't rely on any absence of power. It simply did, as, as I described earlier on. But this point is parasitic on, a, isn't it, on being able to challenge whether the, the ombudsman was right in his approach in saying uh, it's a matter of law as to whether there was or wasn't power to grant a refund. Because that is a question with which this is entangled. If the ombudsman was not in, properly not in a position to and declined to express any view as to whether there was power to order a refund. I don't myself see it's easy to say, well, then he, was, he would have been at fault in failing to say they should have taken into account this as a factor in the exercise of such a discretion, the existence of which is not for me. My Lord, I think I, 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 think I respectfully disagree, if, I, if I've understood correctly, because the, the, again, all the authorities, um, um, Bradford, Eastleigh, refer to the the, the, the ombudsman not not being concerned with the merits of decisions, but the manner in which they're taken. So the, the ombudsman's not concerned with whether it was a right or wrong decision to refuse to refund the fee necessarily. What he's concerned with is whether the manner in which the council approached that issue involved maladministration or fault. And in order to determine that, he can only look at what the council did at the time. Not but I understand I, yeah. I understand your retrospective point. I, I, the point I was putting to you was simply that this is, this is parasitic. Suppose uh, that, that at the time the council had said, we're not going to um, refund the fee because we have no power to do so. Then our complaint would have been a very different one, and it might be that the council that we would that that, the, that, that my client would have taken a claim for judicial review instead of the instead of the uh, instead of an ombudsman's complaint because it might have been thought the council is denied. That, 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 that may be, but the, the, the way that the, the the ombudsman addressed the, the question in his second report was that that was an issue that he was concerned with, and I understand your point that he was wrong on that score because yeah. he was doing something retrospective. Yes, but my point to you was simply if he was if if, you, if you're wrong about that, I don't really see how this point gets no anywhere. no sorry my, my lord then that's why no, I, I, I say, if, if, parasitic. if you're against me on that point and the court concludes it was relevant to whether there was maladministration his decision on maladministration, 
then I accept it's parasitic. Um, if the court, however, accepts <coughs> this, my submission that it is, it was potentially relevant only to injustice, i.e. it doesn't matter what they said at the time, if in reality they didn't have a power, there can't have been any injustice, then it could have been relevant if he proceeded to make a determination whether the power existed or not. But because the Ombudsman eschewed any um, any any wish to do that. I am not going. It's not for me to decide whether the power exists or not. I note simply there are arguments both ways. He could not reach a conclusion on that basis that there was no injustice in my submission. And because, uh, and as I said, my my submission is it was not relevant because of the retrospectivity issue to the to the first part. But yes, my lord, you're right. If I'm if I'm if I'm wrong on the second point, then I, I accept the, the linkage between the two. The case of Balcham, which we looked at a moment ago, provides perhaps a useful analogy. My Lord, so could I ask the court to turn back to that and the authorities again? I think that was tab 24, so it is the second volume. We looked at it briefly. <coughs> It is the it's, it's probably to start at best to start at page five two three the head note. And if you, your lordship, my lady, could just read the, the the facts and the findings of the court rather than me perhaps reading them out. Yes. Sorry, Mr. Hunter, I was just writing a note to myself. Please just give me the reference again. Not at all. It's tab 24, volume 2. Thank you. Page I was, I was the the head notes. A so head note. it, I, it, I think it, rather than having to go oh, through seven, the, seven skits behind the, yeah, the the facts. I think are the. I'll take your lordships to the um, decision in the case. The facts are set out in summary form there. Part of the complaint that was, or the, the claim that was upheld, was the submission that the ombudsman had left out of account an important material consideration by declining to consider whether the county council's refusal to consider exercising its compensatory powers was something which it ought to have been encouraged to do by the department. And. The reasons that that was said to be unlawful are set out further on at page five um, three four on five three five. At the end, 
beginning with, oh, sorry, the, the final two <coughs> paragraphs of 534, going through to the end of 535. It's, 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 but it's an example of the same kind. Uh, a, 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 a central aspect of the complaint, uh, you know, complaints about the council's conduct that the ombudsman decided he couldn't consider because it was not within his remit, him be, he being the parliamentary commissioner rather than within the, the local authority itself. That was held to be error and the decision quashed. I can be given by way of example. Thank you, my lord. My lord I've, I, I think in relation to the second question of fault, because I have traversed that fairly extensively this morning and again this afternoon, my lord. I think I don't I, I think I, I don't think there's anything I can add to my written submissions on that. I would I would be repeating the points I've made already. Uh, so my lord I submit that uh, you you look at uh, the court has my submission with the paragraphs ninety four to ninety nine. So in relation to why you say the retrospectivity issue is crucial. Unless there is anything further and subject to the points on which I promised to come back, uh, those are my submissions. Um, it seems as though there's a developing issue about what or what, what or was not the grounds of appeal. Um, you referred, Mr. Hunt, in the course of your submissions when Mr. Coppel got to his feet to paragraph 89 of your current skeleton argument. Um, was the point made in paragraph 89 of your current skeleton argument made in the skeleton argument that was considered by this court in deciding whether or not to grant permission to appeal? Forgive my lady, can I, um, I will have to, uh, yeah, well, have to double check, check that. that. I propose to address the issues in a slightly different order uh, to my learned friend. Um, firstly, I will look at the February 2021 report and I will submit <coughs> that the Ombudsman reached lawful and indeed correct conclusions in that report and that there is no proper basis for calling into question the um, 
the judge's rejection of the appellant's challenge to the February 2021 report, not least because there has never been any challenge to a significant and freestanding part of the Ombudsman's reasoning in the February 2021 report. Um, secondly, I will submit that the February 2021 report is the operative decision, uh, or, the, or the, the operative report, um, so that if I'm right in submitting that the appeal on ground two should be dismissed, then that is a complete answer to the claim and to the appeal. And the February 2021 report, I will say, is operative either because the August 2019 report was lawfully um, reconsidered, or if it could not be reconsidered, then it should uh, uh, be quashed by this court uh, pursuant to the claim of counsel. Um, I will then move on to address uh, the question of whether the August 2019 report was lawfully reconsidered by, by the Ombudsman, which is ground one of the appeal and one of the points made by the Ombudsman in the respondent's notice. Um, and then finally, so far as um, there's anything left to say, um, I will make submissions as to why this court should quash the Ombudsman. 2019 report uh, if it couldn't lawfully be considered uh, pursuant to the council's claim. Um, so the February 2021 report <coughs> then, that's ground two of the appeal, um, can I start by inviting the court to look at section 26 6C of the 1974 Act. Um, you have it conveniently in page not in paragraph nine of the judgment. Um, you also have it in uh, bundle three at page 692, if that's more convenient. And it provides that an ombudsman shall not conduct an investigation in respect of any of the following matters and see any action in respect of which the person affected has or had a remedy by way of proceedings in any court of law, uh, provided that uh, an ombudsman may conduct an investigation, uh, notwithstanding the existence of such a right or remedy, if satisfied that in particular circumstances it is not reasonable to expect the person affected to resort or have resorted to it. <coughs> so it's not just that you have a remedy uh, and could go elsewhere, it's that you had a remedy and could have gone elsewhere. Both are, both are <coughs> covered by Section 26.6c. Um, as, you, as you know, the learned judge held, in accordance with her understanding of the Croydon case, that once the Ombudsman has got past the initial threshold of starting an investigation, that um, he is then uh, necessarily applying um, section 24A6, which is in paragraph 7 of the judgment, um, in determining whether to initiate, continue, or discontinue an investigation, a local commissioner shall, subject to the provisions of this section and sections 26 to 26D, act in accordance with his own discretion. Uh, and she considered <coughs> that in accordance with Croydon uh, that once the once the investigation has started, um, the commissioner can and indeed should take into account all of the, uh, the Section 26.6c matters. But take into account was my learned friend's formulation. In fact, the formulation in, uh, uh, in Croydon um, is that the, that the commissioner is required um, to consider whether it is appropriate to continue with the investigation on the lines indicated uh, in section 26.6c. Uh, so it's a little bit stronger and it is, is as the judge uh, held, um, you apply section 26.6c through the prism of, uh, of section 24a.6. Now, um, 
having looked at the, the governing provisions, can I then take you back to the appellant's original complaint, uh, which you have seen, but there were certain points that I wanted to highlight. It's at page 34 of the supplementary bundle. points that I wish to draw from the complaint are firstly that the complaint was put in two paragraphs, uh, 1.5 and 1.9, on the basis that the council had acted in a Weddensbury unreasonable manner. Um, um, 1.5 in relation to uh, retaining the fee in the third application despite not having uh, decided it um, and 1.9 uh, um, relies on the irregularities that it says were found by his honour judge Jarman. So it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge put in public law terms uh, within, within, the, within the complaint. Um, the second point um, is that uh, there is not a complaint of maladministration in the determination of the second application. This, this, this is the point which my Lord Lord Justice Bottlewell put to my learned friend. Uh, uh, he, he went somewhat off-piste in his skeleton argument in arguing that there was maladministration uh, in the shape of apparent bias in determining the second application, but that was not uh, how Put the complaint was about the, the treatment of the third application and the fee. Um, the third point, and you need to go to uh, paragraph 1.4 uh, on page 34. Um, is the alternative remedy point. There is no alternative remedy, they say, nor right of appeal against the council's decision to decline to determine the third application or to refuse to return the fee other than judicial review. An application for judicial review has not been made by Piff Limited in relation to either the council's decision uh, not to determine the third application or to refuse to refund the fee. Now, there, there seems to be a misunderstanding Limitation. It's not simply uh, have you invoked the other remedy, it's did you have another remedy which you could have invoked. Um, but they, they proceed on the on the basis that it's that it's sufficient to give the Ombudsman jurisdiction that they haven't brought judicial review, and that's reiterated in paragraph 1.16.1, subparagraph A on the following page. Complaint has not been appealed to nor directly been considered by any court or tribunal. Um, and the final point I wanted to make is that, uh, as as the judge pointed out in her in her judgment, this is a complaint by the company Fifth Sound Limited, and the injustice which is relied upon by the company um, is, see page 36, uh, paragraph 2.1 and 2.2, is financial loss. Um, so sorry, where do you see that? So the reference again. Page 36, uh, middle of the page, 2.1 and 2.2. They describe the injustice. Um, which is financial loss of the planning application fee and other losses, uh, consultants' fees, legal fees, etc. Um, I think the, re the reason why we ended up looking at Balchin in the, in the court below, uh, in my learned friend's reply, was, was 
also for the point that uh, the claimant may have suffered injustice um, simply as a as a result of the of the um, distress caused by the way in which their uh, uh, case has been handled by the authority. But this this was a company which was simply claiming financial loss. And when one comes to look at the ombudsman finding the ombudsman's findings about injustice, that's the that's the that's the context uh, against which that forms to be considered. Um, so we submit, and I'm, I'm uh, well aware, of course, of all the twists and turns and the, the different ways in which the Ombudsman has looked at it over time, but we submit that the February 2021 report uh, arrived at the correct conclusion that this is an obvious case for the application of Section 266C, either on its own or through the prism of Section 24A6. Um, the claimant was plainly raising legal issues. Uh, it had a legal remedy in respect of the issue that it was claiming, and there was no possible basis on which it could be said to be unreasonable to expect them to pursue the legal remedy which they had, i.e. judicial review. <coughs> Is that what the Ombudsman decided in February 21? So I, I'm, I'm going to come on to that, but you, uh, uh, yes, in, in substance, yes. Um, um, but for now, this, this, this was an obvious Section 266C case. Um, no basis for applying the proviso, um, not reasonable to expect to, to, to pursue judicial review, um, highly committed, uh, uh, highly motivated, well-resourced claimant, well-versed in the uh, ins and outs of the administrative court. Um, my learned friend rightly pointed out, as the judge did in paragraph 40 of the judgment, that at one stage in the sequence of draft investigative decisions and draft reports, uh, the second draft investigative decision, the Ombudsman took the view that this was a matter of Simply a matter of planning policy, and therefore not one which which it was reasonable to expect to be to be uh, ventilated in the administrative court. Now that that reasoning was uh, erroneous and was departed from, uh, and and a different approach is 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 adopted both in August 2019 and February 2021. Um, so that doesn't. Um, the alternative remedy point was indeed the Ombudsman's initial reaction to the complaint, see the first draft report, um, um, and he continued to hold that view in relation to the complaint uh, insofar as it related to the termination of the third application. Uh, But he was regrettably uh, diverted from uh, his, his initial position by uh, int the intensive lobbying from both parties, which followed uh, from each of the various iterations um, of, the, of the investigative decisions and, and draft reports. And you will have seen the, the sequence of correspondence in the, uh, in the sub bundle with each iteration of the Ombudsman's proposed findings, you had the party in whose favour uh, the finding had been made saying you ought to have gone further, and the party against whom it had been made saying you need to change your mind altogether. Um, um, all of which, and again with hindsight, uh, uh, and see the Learned Council's opinions that both sides provided, um, all of which rather the legal nature of the dispute between the parties. But we say that the Ombudsman did return to uh, the original position in the final report in February 2021, and ultimately one of the key conclusions reached by the Ombudsman in that report, uh, in paragraph 42 and 40, 
42A and 43, which we'll look at in a moment, um, um, was that the complaint raised legal issues which were suitable for resolution in the courts. So can we, can we just have a look at the February 2021 report, please? Um, 422 of the supplementary bundle. Um, and can I just show you, first of all... Um, sorry, that's 422 of the core bundle. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, core bundle. Um, and just, just a, a couple of paragraphs I wanted to show you uh, before we get to the, the summary of the findings. Paragraph 35 is the um, the retrospective I suppose to call it as, as my as my Lord Colonel Justice Bottlelog has termed it um, and um, the Ombudsman's approach in paragraph 35 um, was firstly to to consider that injustice or no unremedied injustice would flow from the fact that the council adopted its uh, its primary position um, subsequent to the uh, original refusal to refund the fee, um, I think, and I think my learned friend accepted it in his submissions that the retrospective point was was capable of, of uh, or, or that it was legitimate to take into account the later arguments of the council, uh, at least for the purposes of deciding whether injustice had occurred and we would say in particular where the injustice is financial loss um, and one is asking well would the council have have uh, uh, done anything or, or would the outcome have been any different financially for the company uh, if the council had taken its primary point or, or what turned out to be its primary point at the time of refusing the refund so paragraph 35 is quite compressed, but if one looks at the initial response of the council to the request for the refund of the fee, um, and, and as I presumably read it, one reads it as things based on the premise that there is a power, but we're refusing to exercise the power, that's what the Ombudsman is getting at. Is that, is that your submission? Um, no, I'm I'm uh, submitting that um, the the claimant's complaint is can't can't take into account the, what became the council's primary position that it doesn't have a power to return the fee yeah. uh, because it didn't say that at the time. Yeah. Um, Ombudsman said in relation to that, well, it hasn't caused any injustice that they didn't say it at the time. Because my lady's asking, I'm sorry. My lady's asking what, what what's the because that's un, unspecified in paragraph because if they 35. because if they had taken their legal advice and they they got their counsel's opinion uh, before um, refusing the fee as, as opposed to after, um, they would have reached the same conclusion. Um, so so rather than saying we're not refu we're not going to refund the fee for the various reasons that you've seen. Um, they would have said, uh, we're not going to refund the fee because we don't have the power to. Well, they, they may have said that and, and, the, and, and the rest as well. Uh, but it can't, it can't cause injustice in the sense of financial loss um, that the council uh, didn't, didn't get its, uh, um, its legal advice um, at that time as opposed to shortly after. So are you saying that the paragraph 35 cannot be interpreted uh, in the way that I just put to you? I, I just want to understand what your submission is. Um, so I, 
Um, can I just make sure I've understood the question? That, yeah, no, that... it probably wasn't very clear. <laughs> well, the, the, what I'm trying to get at is um, one reading of the council's initial response to the request for the refund is that the council was saying, we're assuming that they had a power to make the refund, but we're saying because of the factors that we identified, we're not going to refund the fee. Yes. Now, is it open? Is, it, is, is one possible construction of paragraph 35, leaving aside um, the question about virus, that one could be pretty sure how the council would have exercised any such discretion because look at the position they took at the time? Yes. One. That, yes, one, one, one can read it like that. And it, and it, and it certainly it is part of my my submissions that, that, that uh, both in, in relation to maladministration and in relation to injustice, that it, it was open to the Ombudsman to consider the point uh, as to whether the Council had any power at all, yeah. um, 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 had, whether, whether it had any, any, any discretion. But um, um, a further point that serves to highlight the great technicality that one, that one uh, has often encountered in this in, in this litigation is that even if the even if the council uh, on 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 the footing that the council had assumed a discretion, it sets out a range of reasons as to why it wasn't going to exercise it. The second sentence of thirty five makes that a sort of slightly less easy interpretation. Because yes. the Ombudsman's keen to make the point that they've taken legal advice and said they've got no discretion. And yes. That rather, does rather point to that being the, yeah. the injustice point. Yes, I, 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 I accept that. Yes. Um, um, but it is not, it's, it's not irrelevant that we know, we know what the Council would, would have said. Well, well, we saw what it did say. Um, and the, although you, I've, I've shown you the, the, um, the response of the 24th of November, the, it, it's, it's not very different. It's a, it's, a, it's a little bit more compressed, but not very different from what they said in the complaints process, which the judge did, did have before her. <coughs> By no injustice, he means no injustice which the Ombudsman has power to deal with, because the Ombudsman is carefully not deciding that the council is right. In, in its view that it had no discretion to refund the fee. But it is saying that that's not something that the Ombudsman can express a view in. And if that is right, it would not uh, be in a position, if the matter came back on that basis, to be able to say injustice caused by maladministration. Because the same, the, 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 the same question would apply to the maladministration aspect. Is that right? Yes. Well, the, well that's how the how the how the judge read the read the paragraph, and we don't we don't dissent from uh, uh, from that. Um, so so um, that's paragraph thirty five. Paragraph thirty nine. Um, you've got the point which wasn't made in the August twenty nineteen report that it's not fault for the council to have got the law wrong, provided there are reasonable arguments for it having adopted. There are now not not uh, entirely happily phrased um, um, because, of course, the council didn't say at the time, as, as the ombudsman is well aware, didn't say at the time we have no power. Um, but um, we say that it was, and, and one one reads um, thirty nine with subsequent. Paragraphs 41, 42, and 43, the Ombudsman was entitled uh, to take into account the Council's subsequent position, we had no power, uh, <coughs> in considering whether there had been maladministration or not. Uh, so, not just injustice, but also the, the, the first question of whether there had been maladministration. It is a matter within the discretion of the Ombudsman to. To define what is going to be maladministration in any individual case, <coughs> and to put the matter shortly, it, 
it's it, it wouldn't be maladministration, or or at least the ombudsman would be entitled to say that it's not maladministration to err in the exercise in the purported exercise of the discretion, which in fact one didn't actually have. So so it was relevant for the council to say, well, whatever we whatever we might have said in purporting to exercise a discretion, that's what we did at the time, we had no discretion, um, so so not maladministration. Um, and there's no rule that the Ombudsman has to has to hold the parties to what they said at the time, uh, or to hold the to hold the authority to the arguments which they raised at the time and not and not shortly afterwards. Um, and of course, one has to bear in mind that this is a somewhat one-sided submission from Mr. Hunter, because his clients are apparently entitled to raise a whole series of arguments, like Section 92 of the Local Government Act 2000, which which weren't raised at any stage before the Ombudsman, but only came up in the course of this litigation. Um, so it's open to them. Well, hang on. <laughs> Section 92 was raised, but it's referred to in I'm sorry, which, which, which wasn't raised at the time of the complaint to the council. Right. I, I, uh, it's, uh, so so, we're to, so the, the council is to be held and the ombudsman's analysis is to be held to what the council said at the time uh, of, the, of the refund consideration, but the claimant uh, is not to be held to what they said at the time. Uh, at the, the time, yeah. the council which wasn't time? saying they had no discretion, no. so Section 92 was nothing to the thing. The council was saying, we're not going to pay you back because we told you we weren't going to pay you back, and you still paid us. Yes, my lord, I, I accept that. Um, and I return to the point that I made, uh, not maladministration, or the ombudsman entitled to say not maladministration, to, to err in the purported exercise of discretion, which one didn't actually have. Um, if they didn't have one. If, if they didn't they have one. Not have which, which they which they might not have had. Um, which is the next point um, that or, or it's the it's the it's the point which is in substance being made in paragraph thirty nine that that when one comes to look at the legal arguments as to whether the council had the discretion or not, um, the standard position and it's uh, arising from long standing ombudsman case law. Um, um, is that it's not maladministration? Uh, uh, it, it is. It isn't maladministration simply to proceed on an on an erroneous legal basis. Um, the question is whether there are uh, reasonable, respectable arguments for the position that was adopted. <coughs> and the ombudsman goes on then to find in 41 and 42 that there were reasonable or respectable arguments for the council not refunding the fee um, um, in the shape of the the arguments around discretion and, and the existence of discretion or not and 43a um, 42a sorry 42a is the 266C, um, 24A6 point is it? as to. I thought, I thought 24A, uh, you didn't have a way off being, but I thought the 24A, 26C point was concerned with an alternative remedy. Whereas 42A looks to me as though it's based on the Ombudsman's powers not to make binding decisions of law. It doesn't, so, um, it doesn't address alternative remedies at all, does it? Well, I mean, we, there are... Um, but that's the implication, because the, 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 um, the restriction to jurisdiction of 26.6c is essentially to ensure, as far as possible, that legal issues are resolved by the courts, not by the Ombudsman. Is that your point? Yes. Yes. So, that, so, that, so, so there is a jurisdictional limitation uh, where there are legal issues that, that can be resolved by the courts. 
Um, the Ombudsman function is not to resolve legal issues. Um, um, and as I was dismissing a, a moment ago, whether an authority has committed maladministration is a different question from whether uh, the case has acted contrary to the law. <coughs> um, so, so when. There is what, the point rather that 2660 is, is the implicit background for the point of knowing who is correct? Um, it, it, yes, it, it, well, it, it, it's certainly the, the implicit background and informs um, 42A, and one sees that both from 43, uh, the final sentence of 43, um, the Ombudsman cannot determine legal matters and there's no good reason why the complainant cannot take the matter to court for a definitive determination. Um, and one can go back to uh, earlier in the report, uh, paragraph 6, where there's express reference to section 266C, unlike in some of the previous Iterations. But are, 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 are those not different points? As I understand it, I may have completely misunderstood it, the Ombudsman simply has no power to determine legal rights and where to find them in party. That's, that's one point. There's a separate point, which is a process point, in 26C and 24A, which is that it will leave the parties to go to court in circumstances where they can, unless it's unreasonable for them to do so or to have done so. And those aren't, those aren't the same points, are they? Um, no, they aren't the same points. And, it, it, and I, I certainly agree the Ombudsman doesn't determine legal rights, and, and, and that's a point which we'll, which, uh, which we'll come back to when we come to withdrawal of the August 20, 2019 report. Um, but there's a very close relationship between the jurisdictional limitation in section 266C that legal claims of um, legal rights are for the are for the are for the court. So so the so the Ombudsman simply can't, not won't, but can't investigate uh, um, matters which which could be ventilated in court subject only to the proviso. Um, there's a, the, a close relationship between the jurisdictional limitation and the Ombudsman's function as, as uh, being there to resolve issues of maladministration as opposed to questions of law. Um, and, and I accept that they're all, all, all these, these thoughts are um, um, compressed into, into 42A, but if you read it together with, with 43, um, um, it is in my submission clear that what is being said here is that this is a case which raises legal issues which should could should have been taken to court rather than to the Ombudsman. And the judge found that this was a separate strand of reasoning in the Ombudsman's February 2021 decision. Um, and we've explained that in our in paragraphs 29 and 30 of our Sullivan argument. Um, paragraph 29 points out there was never any challenge before the judge to 42A and 43. Um, she pointed that out. Uh, well, it's, 40, it's, it's 43, really, isn't it? It's the, it's the last half of the last sentence of 43. If you didn't have that, you might struggle to say this is a 266C, 24A decision. Because everything else is framed in terms of how to determine legal matters, which is Christian. Well, well look, there's um, also the wording in 42A that... that the, um, the Ombudsman considers that making a finding would place them at risk of making a legal determination or treading into the jurisdiction of the courts. So, that, so there is a jurisdictional point being made there as, as 
well. Certainly the, the final sentence of 43 makes it clear. Um, so um, the judge accepted separate strand of reasoning. Um, she accepted see paragraphs 112 to 113 of the judgment that there had been no challenge to that strand of the Ombudsman's reasoning. Um, and, and so 114, um, um, effectively, the, the challenge to the February 2021 report failed because here's a, a separate and freestanding uh, uh, basis for the decision which was simply not challenged. And the position as to there being no challenge uh, remained the case on, on, on the appeal. Um, and that's one of the reasons, so, so we say that in paragraph 30 of our skeleton argument, that's one of the reasons why there was a bit of to and fro about the grounds of appeal, uh, because we wanted to be absolutely clear that there wasn't going to be a late challenge to, uh, to 42A and 43. <coughs> so the, 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 the correctness of that reasoning is simply not a matter for this court. Um, and on that basis, and following through the reasoning of the judge, um, the challenge to the February 2021 report, round two, must must fail. Um, and that's, uh, I, I accept somewhat obliquely put, but is put in in issue uh, 14 of the list of issues. Um, um, that even, even if you, you agree with my learned friend on his other points on the February 2021 report, um, here's a freestanding um, basis for it being for it being lawful and not being under challenge in this court. Well, it was squarely raised in your skeleton. So I will very briefly address um, the other grounds of challenge to the February 2021 report that it, that uh, uh, proviso in mind. Um, the context ground um, is a challenge to paragraph 48 of the Ombudsman's uh, February 2021 report at page 424, which you heard from Mr. Hunter about this afternoon. Um, we've not reached a view on the reasonableness of the Council's actions in the context of the first two planning applications because our jurisdiction prevents us from determining the legal status of those applications. Um, I commend and really can't improve on paragraphs 105 to 109 of the judgment on this point. Um, the reason I was on my feet earlier this afternoon was to object to my learned friend challenging the judge's factual finding in paragraph 107. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, um, where she had said that she she didn't understand the refund to have been refused because the council had rejected His Honour Judge Jarman's uh, findings. That's, that's, that's what the claimant, that's how the claimant characterised it. She rejected that in paragraphs 29 and 30 and so rejected also the context uh, 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 grounds. Um, and that, that's not, simply not open for argument in this court. And then she says, in any event, the LGO, this is 107, paragraph 
Addendum 7 on page 158 of the bundle. Um, in any event, the LGO acted reasonably in assessing that this point was also bound up with the legal issues that he reasonably considered should be determined by court um, proceedings. Um, and we say that, that again, is, a, is, is an entirely correct and unimpeachable finding. Um, what you have from my learned friend is with reference to an opinion which he produced early in the, in the uh, doings and proings with the Ombudsman, is the argument that, uh, well, we, we, we weren't asking the Ombudsman to decide whether the, the first two planning decisions were null and void. We simply wanted him to recognise that they were tainted with apparent bias. Well, that, putting it that way, raises legal issues. In fact, in fact perhaps raises more legal issues than, than saying that they're, that they're null and void. What does, it, what does it mean? What does it imply that they're <coughs> tainted with apparent bias? What are, the, what are supposed to be the consequences of that? I think the argument is it doesn't, you don't have to ascribe any legal meaning to tainted. It is simply, if and on the hypothesis, that what the Ombudsman ought to have been confining himself to, which was, ignore the subsequent argument that there's no power, was the discretion properly exercised at the time. It was a matter which the Council should have taken into account that the second application was infected with some procedural defect. True, it may be that that procedural defect wasn't sufficient either to nullify the decision or to render unlawful the third application decision. But nevertheless, in, in the exercise of a discretion in circumstances where they were paying a fee for the third time, it was a matter that they should have taken into account. And that's, that, as I understand it, is the argument. I may have got it wrong, but that's... Well, um, I, I maintain it's a, it's, it's a legal argument. <laughs> Uh, or, it's, or it's an argument which raises uh, and is bound up with legal issues. And one sees that from the way that the Council responded to the argument in its complaints process and indeed in the 24th of November decision which you've, which you've, which you've seen today. What the Council said was, well, Sir Judge Jarman didn't quash um, the second decision. He said, you, sh you should appeal it, and you didn't. Um, now, that's a legal response. Um, is that a sufficient legal response to tainted by apparent bias? Well, that's a difficult legal, legal, legal question. But I think I think the answer to that is it's not it's not a question of whether the decision is quashed or not. It's simply one of the background considerations that is, is is at least relevant as to whether they should get back the fee paid for a third application when. Uh, there was something that went wrong with, if one can put it in entirely non-legal terms, the second application. Yes, but well, it's, it, with respect, it's wholly artificial to say that something non-legal went wrong with the second application when, when what is said to have gone wrong is apparent bias. Um, um, and the, the I'm just reading from the, the 24th of November letter. Uh, the third application was not the subject of any challenge. It's clear from the court's judgment that after the second application was refused, it should have been appealed. I mean, these are legal points. Um, and there isn't a neat uh, uh, division between null and void on the one hand and um, legal and something went wrong uh, on the other hand, non-legal. It's all... But I thought that that's I thought the Ombudsman was often concerned with matters that were perfectly lawful, but were regarded as something which might give rise to a legitimate sense of grievance uh, and give rise to an administrative remedy. He, and, he and certainly is, my lord. But but the, but that's not the question here. The question here is whether the Ombudsman was right to say that um, these these matters that you've asked us to consider are so bound up with legal issues that you yourselves have, in fact, uh, uh, disavowed earlier in the, in the, in the process, um, um, that, that uh, we, can't, we can't consider them. Um, our, 
jurisdiction prevents us from determining the legal status of those applications. And it, it, in our submission, it's, it's, it's simply not enough to say, well, um, we weren't asking you to, to consider null and void for some, some, other, some other problem. Um, this, was all, this was all a legal matter, as the, as the council response has shown. Um, but I, so I, I do rely on the, <coughs> on the judges' uh, reasoning, 107, 108, and 109. And the point that she makes in, a, in 109, and again, it's, it's somewhat ironic, that, that um, the Ombudsman was only uh, persuaded to continue with the investigation at all uh, uh, by the by, the claimants agreeing to to drop or, or saying that they they dropped part of their part of their complaint. Um, and if and I, I, as the as the as the judge says, it's quite clear that if the ombudsman had concluded that it was necessary for him to consider the Jarman judgment and the two earlier refusals of planning permission um, in order to decide the complaint, he would have permissibly reverted to the outcome he'd earlier. There's no needless continuation of the whole investigation. But one just has this constantly shifting uh, position by the claimant. One has a letter from the, his solicitors that you saw. You have a council's opinion, and it's not entirely consistent with the letter, and still relies on, on, the, on the decision. And just a constant uh, change, 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 until well, we, we, we have this complex ground which, which we say was rightly rejected by the judge. That um, context, um, the fault uh, ground then, um, I think I've, I've essentially made my submissions on uh, no unremedied injustice, um, which is part of, the, part of the fault ground, that's paragraph 35 of the February 2021 decision. Um, <coughs> and I, I, I simply refer you back to the judge's um, reasoning in paragraph 116 um, on page 159 of the core bundle the ombudsman was not exercising a judicial review jurisdiction uh, in which the decision maker may be held to reasons given at the time of the decision, but exercising a broad discretion in determining whether injustice had been caused. Uh, furthermore, the absence of the power to refund the application fee was a central plank of the council's responses, and, and plainly the position it would take in response to any recommendation that the LGO made. Um, it was legitimate in exercising a broad discretion, we would say, for the LGO to consider whether that position involved fault. <coughs> And then in the paragraph 117 uh, makes the point that this was a company seeking financial remedies, which I have already made. Um, the other aspect of the fault ground then is the um, is the section 92 of the Local Government Act, um, which is the primary basis on which it is said. Uh, had um, jurisdiction, um, had had a had a discretion to refund the fee, and um, we say the judge got the got the matter entirely right in paragraph one hundred and twenty six. This point only arises where the authority considers. That action taken by or on its behalf amounts to or may amount to maladministration. It's clear that TBC did not have either of those states of mind in this instance. The council firmly considered that it was fully entitled to retain the payment. Now, the the origin of this uh, power, is, as I think the judge mentioned, is to give is to give local authorities um, unarguable virus to act to correct uh, or to, to, to compensate for maladministration um, 
both before an ombudsman's ruling uh, and, and after. There's a, there's, a, there's a further power in the, in the 1974 Act to make payments following a finding of administration for this, for this uh, in particular review of systems where the authority considers that there's been maladministration without the ombudsman in, in, in advance of the ombudsman saying so. Um, so, for example, if uh, under the complaint process, the council had in this case thought, oh, actually, we have made a bit of a mistake here, that, that would have given them power to make a payment in recognition of that. If they, if they felt that there if would they, have, If that's yeah. what they thought. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, if, and if they thought that, uh, that there had been or may have been maladministration, yes. Yes. Um, but, but, of course, um, the way the point is now put by my learned friend is not to say that that's what the council did think, it's to say that's what they should have thought. Is there a separate power somewhere to do that if they have in fact been guilty of maladministration but don't consider that they have? Um, so, yes, in the in section in the 1974 Act itself, um, there is a power uh, to make payments consequent upon recommendation of the Ombudsman. Uh, going to, yes, it's section uh, 31.3b um, on page 724. <coughs> So it's still it's still premised on uh, it appears to the authority that a payment should be made, um, um, but also a pre necessary precondition is that uh, uh, an ombudsman's report has been laid to the authority. Yes, yes, sorry, yeah, that, yeah, uh, absolutely. So this is a power which arises following un, uh, a finding by the ombudsman. Um, and as as we'll see. When we come to the withdrawal uh, ground, um, there is a process of um, uh, enforcement by way of shorthand of what the ombudsman finds in his in his reports, uh, which doesn't always lead to um, um, the local authorities uh, giving effect to the recommendations that the ombudsman makes. Um, they're not legally bound to do so. Um, they usually do so, and there's a process to be followed if they don't do so. So, so there's a there's a power in section thirty one if the ombudsman has found that administration. Power in section 92 if the local council, the local authority considers that it is or may have been guilty of maladministration. Is there a power if the court decides on a judicial review that the decision is flawed? Um, well, um, there may be a difference, of course, between between the court deciding the decision is flawed and there being there there being um, maladministration, uh, potentially maladministration. Um, but I don't I don't exclude the possibility that, that, that yes, a, a 
but where does that power come from? I mean, I quite understand that the court, the court probably won't make a finding of maladministration on a JR, um, but it may say that a decision was hopelessly flawed on public law grounds. Um, yeah. So then one goes goes back to section ninety two of two thousand. So it's not it's a it is it is conceivable in those circumstances that that the dependent authority may consider that action that they took in exercise of their functions amounted to or may have amounted to maladministration. I suppose well, of course they may, but uh, they may say no. We don't. We think the court got that wrong. And, they, and then, okay. and then there's no power. To, there's no power. Well, Lord, um, whether there's a power to make payments or give other kinds of redress to individuals who who complain of maladministration, that will first and foremost depend on the on the relevant statutory scheme which the authority was applying. There may well be powers within whatever statutory scheme it is. To, to put the matter right, um, what what section thirty one, two bit three b does, and section ninety two, uh, similarly does, is to um, to avoid to avoid argument um, where the ombudsman has found, firstly, uh, maladministration, uh, or section ninety two where where the authority considers <coughs> maladministration for other reasons. I mean, a, a, a good example of Section 92 in action would be um, somebody complains to the Ombudsman, um, gets a finding of, of maladministration and a recommendation as to compensation, and then somebody else who's in exactly the same position, but who hasn't complained to the Ombudsman, goes to the local authority and says, well, look, you did exactly the same to me. Um, I don't have an Ombudsman's report. Um, um, whether or not you've got power somewhere else, you've got power under section 92 to, to make a payment. And if um, arguably an occasion for the exercise of the section 92 power rules and the local authority said no, we're not exercising the power, uh, that refusal could be jailed. Um, so in other words, if, if a claimant said to the court that they've got this power under Section 92, it's absolutely clear that it's a case of maladministration and they're refusing to exercise it, that claimant could apply for judicial review of that refusal to exercise the power, whether they'd succeed or not is another issue. But that remedy would exist. Yes, 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 it is. It's, it would. And I, I mean, there's a, there's a little bit of wriggle room... Um, the authority may, if they think appropriate, make a payment, and there may be well, other reasons conceivably. Yeah, yeah. But yes, in, in principle, yes. And you've also got to consider the, the, the difference between court proceedings and the more informal procedure before the LGA. Yes, yes, and certainly we, for my my clients who sit behind me, would in, would encourage local authorities. Um, um, to uh, to meet complaints of, mal of maladministration even before they get to the ombudsman, but certainly before they get to the court. Thank you. So that's that's the February twenty twenty one report. I I say ombudsman was lawful and indeed correct conclusions. Um, the February 2021 report is the operative decision, um, either because uh, the 2019 report was lawfully withdrawn or because you should quash the August 2019 report. Um, we do not, or we submit that the court should not take the view that uh, if, the, if the August 2019 report is quashed, the February 2021 report shouldn't be left standing because it was written at a time when the August 2019 report was still in existence. Well, we've indicated we think that's a point for Mr. Hubbard to take if he's going to, and he's going to let us know when it is. Uh, perhaps it's best you to leave that. I shall, I shall take it. Until he does, if he does. Um, 
I, d I will simply uh, draw your attention to a submission that the council makes in its skeleton argument for the appeal, which is really to the effect of whatever you do, um, today can this be the end of it? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I paraphrase this, but uh, uh, finality is something that they're very, they're very keen on. Good. <coughs> So, um, the August 2019 report then, um, decision to withdraw the August 2019 report, ground one, it uh, falls into two parts. Firstly, was the August 20, 2019 report um, reasonably considered to be, to be legally flawed or legally flawed for the, the, the reasons my Lord was discussing with, with Mr Hunter and we see no reason why. Given the, given the council's claim, the court should not uh, go that further step and, and, and consider the, uh, whether the 2019 report was indeed legally flawed. Um, and then, secondly, um, should there, is there, or was there a power in the Ombudsman to withdraw the August 2019 report on the grounds that he reasonably Um, so, in terms of what were the legal um, difficulties with the August 2019 report, um, we need to go to the core bundle at 409. Is a, at least potentially, it yeah. is a, it is a lot. Yeah. 
I think I think it. Um, therefore, <coughs> paragraph 37, we therefore find fault with the council for failing to consider its discretion to refund the planning application fee. <coughs> so, um, that's the first um, problem, and, it, and it's a significant problem, even, even if it was appropriate for the Ombudsman to, to be making a ruling on this issue. Um, um, the, the reasoning is plainly uh, flawed. Um, so, sorry to interrupt. So is your submission that there is no power to make a, a refund then, in terms? Um, there is no express power in the fees regulations to, or, or indeed any, anywhere in the in the planning legislation, to make to make a ref, uh, to a, a discretion to refund. Uh, separate from the various instances of duty to refund, it's not it's not my position. hasn't been my position in the litigation that there is or there isn't definitively uh, uh, discretion to refund, but simply that there are um, respectable arguments each way. And we had Mr. Hunter on the one side and Mr. Pereira for the council on the other before the learned judge. Uh, um, why there is or there isn't a, a discretion, but there isn't an express discretion in the planning legislation. Um, I had thought it, that it did have to be your position, at least in response to Mr. Hunter's argument, which is it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter if the Ombudsman wrongly relied on Harrison and O'Brien because there is a power in section 92 to us that there, there isn't a relevant power. In yes, so, 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 so I, I said there, um, there isn't an express power in the planning legislation. No. I, I, I appreciate it. I, I, I dealt with Section 92, and there were some other general local authority powers which I don't, don't relied on before the judge. Well, the Local is a maxim, sorry. Yes, yeah. it's a maxim, Section 111 of the 92 Act. And again, there, there, are, there are arguments. Uh -huh. um, Those um, 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 and I, I, I don't need. That's my, my, I don't need to go so far as to say, as the as the judge did, that section ninety two is is inapplicable. Um, all I all I have to, to to do is to say that there are arguments either way as to whether it is all. Or not. But also, there's a difference between a power to refund the fee in specie and um, a power to compensate when the local authority considers, I mean, in short, that there's been maladministration if you didn't read. Yes. Yes, they, they are, and it certainly was a. And this case seems to be just on the basis that there was a power to refund the fee. Yes. Yes, they. they until, until the. Uh, Doings and throwings during the Ombudsman's investigation, and certainly at, at the time of the complaint, the original refund request and the complaint to the local authority, this was all put on the basis that there's a discretion under the fees regulation. And the section, I, I, I can't remember when was section 92 first relied on? Um, I'd have to look and I'll, I'll, I'll check when it first emerged during the investigation. It's it's not in the in the original complaint to the ombudsman. Um, I expect that when the council started to argue that it had no no discretion, Mr. Hunter uh, responded yeah. with section ninety two amongst others. Okay. <coughs> So that's, uh, that's the, the, the first legal flaw. Second legal flaw, um, which seems to the Ombudsman to uh, undermine the August 2019 report, was the, um, the, the taking of a definitive decision uh, 
as to whether there was a discretion rather than asking whether there were respectable arguments uh, for the council's position that there um, was, was no discretion. Um, there's no doubt that that is the, uh, the, the, the correct approach is the uh, <coughs> are, there, are there reasonable grounds, see Hayward's number, number one. Um, and then so, so what this point comes back to is the, uh, the retrospective point. Um, did, it, did it matter uh, um, um, that the council hadn't taken the no discretion point at the time? Um, um, and I say that it was, it, it was still, um, I, I, I say, and I think essentially for reasons that I've already given, that the Ombudsman was entitled to consider the what had become the council's primary uh, line of argument, no, no discretion, uh, because not not maladministrative to to err uh, in the exercise in the purported exercise of a discretion to have. Um, that was an issue fairly and squarely raised, and then in addressing it, the ombudsman was required to apply the the uh, the normal approach and ask whether there were reasonable or respectable arguments rather than, than reaching a definitive conclusion either way. And the third um, legal flaw is one which the learned judge didn't accept when it came to the August 2019 report, but she did accept uh, on the um, she accepted the argument on the February 2021 report that the Ombudsman was entitled to find Section 26.6c Section 24.86 um, um, you could and should have gone to court um, but she didn't accept that that was a that there was a flaw in the August 2019 report um, um, by reason of the Ombudsman not making that finding, not, not making the 42A and 43 finding in the August 2019 report. Um, the, uh, and, and, and not expressly considering the, the, um, the jurisdictional issue which arose, not applying the proviso, etc. Um, I, I say simply, if, if the point is a good one, or if, if the Ombudsman's reasoning in the February 2021 report is correct, and it, and it, and it must stand for the reasons I've given. This applies just as much to the first two. Yeah. And we've um, set out in some detail in paragraphs 13 to 18 of the skeleton arguments as to why um, um, the judge uh, uh, accepted that additional error as, as well. Um, there is an issue of law um, which arises and which the learner judge addressed uh, in the context of the August 2019 report, um, which is whether the jurisdictional point uh, arises under Section 266C throughout the investigation or only at the start, she said, in, in accordance with Croydon, only at the start. Um, but you have to apply Section 266C throughout the, the investigation in the same way. And that, and that was a, we say, a, a, a faithful reflection of what was decided in Croydon. But in paragraph 18 of our skeleton argument, we, we argue that the analysis in Croydon was not um, correct. Now, it, it may be that this is, this is a bridge too far in terms of what you need or want to decide. Uh, but we say that, that, the, that it, it is section 26. 
6C, which applies um, throughout, and we give reasons for that. Paragraph 18 of our skeleton, um, subparagraph 1, we point to the wording, and I should have underlined it, um, in section 24A6, that the Ombudsman shall subject to the provisions of this section and sections 26 and 26D act in accordance with his own discretion. Um, the point being that that um, the, the Ombudsman's wide discretion under section 24A6 only arises once he's applied once the jurisdictional uh, provisions and uh, once 24A and 26 and 26D have have been exhausted. So, so um, if there is a if there is a jurisdictional issue under Section 26 C, that must be addressed before you get to discretion under Section 26. Um, I appreciate I, I haven't been showing you the, the version of the 74 Act in the, in the bundle of authority. Um, 24A is 682, and section 26 is 691. So what are you saying is wrongly decided? So, um, in the in the Croydon case, and perhaps let's let's. Act divided twenty three. Well, that's the decision of the divisional court. Yes. So it's not binding on us. No. Uh, but you said paragraph eighteen. Did you say of my of my skeleton? Of oh, yes. your skeleton. Sorry. sorry. Yes. Sorry. So um, paragraph eighteen explains why, in our submission, you shouldn't adopt the judge's analysis in the Croydon. Analysis that the only concern with the threshold. Um, first reason, section twenty six six c is prior to the section twenty four a six discretion. Second reason is really one of practicality um, that you that, that one can't expect the ombudsman to know sufficiently at the start. Or, or Really, before he's even embarked on an investigation, to know in all cases whether this is a matter which which um, um, could have been ventilated in the courts and should have been ventilated in the courts, and he may indeed have to proceed some way down the road of his investigation before he's able to decide on that. And what difference does it make? Because if you look at page five twenty of the bundle, Lord Justice Wolfe said, "Well." Doesn't really matter which way I decide it, because it's a continuing obligation. Yeah. yeah. So isn't it a distinction without a difference, or, or are we missing something? Well, it's a, it's if it applies in terms, it's mandatory. If it applies in the way Lord Wolf considered it, it's perhaps a bit fluffier in terms of the yes, it's, it's a, and the and oh, I see. Yeah. And, um, mean, yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a little bit fluffier. The way Lord Justice Wolfe applies it, it's very fluffy when Mr. Hunter comes to apply it, <laughs> um, and 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 that's our third point in paragraph eighteen that that if you if you treat it all as part of the broad discretion under section twenty four a six, that rather tends to obscure the mandatory yeah. nature of twenty six six c, subject to the proviso. It occurs to me, I was part of Constitution in, in a um, relatively recent decision about 26C, which 26C was raised a case called Milburn. Um, I can't now remember whether it, any of the points that were decided in Milburn are relevant, but you might want to check those in 1928. Um, in the middle of writing an article. <laughs> no. I mean, it may, it may not be, but it's just, just popped into my head. Um, so, those are my three um, 
legal errors, um, which we say the Ombudsman reasonably uh, considered to arise out of the 2019 report. Um, there's, a, there's a factual finding by the judge. Um, or, or I don't think that you did think that at the time, um, to which we pointed to, to the Ombudsman's pre-action letter, which uh, the response letter, which does take the point um, squarely. Um, but the, the, uh, the next question then, which, which arises and which perhaps is the question which, which motivated Lord Justice <coughs> Singh to grant permission in, in this case, uh, 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 um, on a, some other compelling reason basis, um, is, the, uh, is that of whether the Ombudsman <coughs> has the implied power um, to withdraw a report which he reasonably considers to be in legal error. Can I, just before you leave that, yeah. and if we're leaving the reports now, ask you this question, which is, I mean, we've seen lots of reports, drafts, final reports, but nowhere has the Ombudsman addressed what I now understand the, to be the fundamental point on the other side, which is it's mal maladministration to make two planning decisions affected by apparent bias, but then to keep fees for the third application just because you've warned them that you might. And when you warned them, um, no one knew that there was apparent bias. And, and what do you say about that? Well, um, um, I mean, we, we said quite a lot about that, and the and the and the council has said quite a lot about that. Um, the first thing that we say is that all of the extensive reasons why the council should have, uh, on the claimant's case, refunded the fee, given what had gone before, were reasons which were capable of being uh, taken on on on, on judicial review. Um, um, uh, then, on the, if you then proceed from the from the jurisdictional um, um, issue, um, the you had the the claimant um, withdrew the complaint against the third planning decision, and then there was various all various to and fro about about. Um, the entanglement of of the uh, uh, of the earlier two planning decisions with the third decision and uh, the decision to refund, um, and the ombudsman and, and we we you know, I've dealt with the context ground, which is having having um, um, rightly ruled out. Um, the impact of the earlier planning decisions on the third application, um, it was uh, the ombudsman was entitled to to um, um, to to not address the the uh, the apparent bias in the earlier two decisions, which which was was not how the how the complaint was originally put. Um, and thirdly, then I think the and I. The, the, the council isn't here, um, but the you've seen the arguments that the council uh, raised in response to the claimant, which weren't which weren't limited to um, we don't agree there was apparent bias, and we we we, we warned you um, um, that there was a a range of other reasons, as as found by the by the judge. Um, including the, what is on a judge, Jarman decided, um, didn't didn't quash the second decision, invited the claimants to appeal. We don't know why they didn't appeal. Um, they then made the third application, which which entailed um, the council to um, to deal with it, to register it, to consider it, to make a decision on it, um, and the fees would apply in the in the. The usual way. Um, so, well, Lord, I, of course, of course I, 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 
understand the point, but but really, a, the the majority of my submissions have been directed one way or, or another to to address any of this. Thank you. And I just have one question, if I may, on the, on the report before we go on to the, yep. the general point of principle. It arises out of paragraph thirty-seven of, of which report? Of, of the of the August report. We therefore find fault with the council for failing to consider its discretion. Um, and you identified that the therefore is based on the on the taking the, the council's up to date position that it had no power, had no discretion to exercise, and you've explained why that's uh, perfectly sensible uh, and uh, was entitled without any breach of any retrospectivity requirement, but that on that basis the reasons that were given were flawed. I understand all that. But if uh, Mr Hunter were right on his retrospectivity argument and uh, what the Ombudsman ought to have been doing was addressing the reasons given at the time, which did not include we have no power to then do you say, well, even on that hypothesis, paragraph 37 is flawed, because if that's the hypothesis, they had considered the exercise of discretion and made, uh, as we've seen from the letter, given their reasons on a discretionary basis for refusing to return the fee? Um, yes, I, I, I do say that. I mean, I, there, are, there are problems with paragraph 37 of this report. Um, not least because it misidentifies the the, the complainant. <laughs> um, 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 the well, all right, but and, that apart. Well, well, look, in terms of um, injustice, um, which is the um, so that so so you can you can compare and contrast with the equivalent paragraph in the in the February 2021 report. But in terms of injustice, it is, as I've submitted, significant that, that um, the injustice complained of was, was financial loss. I understand Be that, but I'm not quite seeing how that goes to the point that we're on at the moment. Well, because um, um, once one is clear that, that one is looking for financial loss, then the, then the point you put to me, uh, well, um, we know what the council would have said um, if they had thought there was a discretion because they did actually say it and they gave a range of reasons um, um, that then um, is um, is relevant to uh, to the finding of, of no injustice because the outcome would not have been any, any, any different. No, I was putting you a slightly different, a slightly different point. Um, uh, to see which I, I thought was a point in your favour, um, to see whether it, whether it is, it is a point you're taking, which is um, essentially Mr. Hunter says, well, may have been wrong about uh, uh, Harrison and O'Brien, and may have been wrong uh, about um, failing to take account of the respectable arguments approach, if. The right approach was to treat the question that matters as to whether there was or was not the existence of a discretion, which is what he appears to have done. But that wasn't the right question, and therefore you could ignore all that, because actually what mattered was uh, what was the maladministration in relation to the decision which wasn't taken on the basis that there was no power. And what I'm asking you is, is whether you're saying, well, uh, that you can't save the report on those grounds because uh, you're then left with paragraph 37 which says there was a failure to consider exercising the discretion and that's what they've got to do and if that's the hypothesis on which the report should have been proceeding namely um, that they accepted that there wasn't, there wasn't discretion um, then they did exercise they did exercise it, and and the finding in the second half of the 
paragraph because there is un there's injustice because there is uncertainty as to whether they would have received a refund had the council considered its discretion. Well, there isn't uncertainty. <coughs> um, Did the Ombudsman have power to withdraw the August 2019 report? Um, some basic principles that we say uh, should govern the court's um, consideration of this issue. Firstly, what is the doctrine of functus officio? Um, my learned friend took you to the definition in Demetrio, para 42. A judicial ministerial or administrative actor has performed a function in circumstances where there's no power to revoke or modify it, and we, we respectfully adopt that definition. Um, the point is put in rather more dogmatic, and we say, with <coughs> respect, incorrect terms by Lord Justice Peter Jackson in the Sun Mateen case, uh, because he leaves out uh, of his uh, uh, statement of the principle. Um, the important qualification where there is no power to revoke or modify it. Um, um, and you'll uh, recall from my learned friend's um, submissions that he simply says um, once a public authority exercising a statutory power has decided how the power is to be exercised, it will lack further authority and be functus officio. So there's a there's, a, there's a, an important stage of analysing whether there is power to revoke or modify the, the decision. Um, second principle, we say there is no universally uh, applicable rule that decision makers are functus officio because they cannot review and withdraw their own decisions, or that they are not functus officio. Um, all depends on the particular decision maker, the particular statutory regime, and the particular decision which has been adopted and uh, <coughs> now wishes to be revoked uh, within that statutory regime. And and that really was that, that was common ground for the for the judge uh, within the within the statement of facts and grounds, um, and it was common ground between us that in this case. As in every case raising a functus issue, the answer lies in interpretation of the statutory powers. Um, thirdly, as a principle, we say that exercise of interpretation is informed, should be informed by section 12, 1 of the Interpretation Act. Um, and the question is essentially in every case whether the contrary appears. Um, we say the effect of section 12 which is set out in paragraph 66 of the judgment um, and not in the authorities bundle um, the effect of section 12 is in general to imply a power to revoke and remake a decision save where the contrary appears now um, the impact and the significance of section 12 is... So how do you get that out of the language, or are you just saying it's implicit in the language? Um, well, it's the... It's the... Um, I'm looking at paragraph 66. Um, the power may be exercised or the duty is to be performed from time to time as occasion requires. Um, and it, it's really, I, I say it, it is, it is uh, implicit, if not express, in, in well, from I, time to I, time I, as occasion requires. Really it's, it's express, it doesn't say 
when, when you're given a statutory power, um, you can you can at any time revoke it and re-exercise it if you feel like it. But something rather different. Well, it's. I, I, I mean, it's necessary. It, it has to be in, implied, isn't it, in your case? Well, um, you say it's necessarily implicit that if you can exercise a power for a second time, you may exercise it differently or inconsistently from the first time. And if you do so, that must necessarily involve revoking to that extent the, the first exercise. Um, so it, it is implicit, not, not explicit. Yes. Oh, I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit mixed up. I, I seem like the same. No, 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 it's my fault for not asking a clear question. Um, a, it's a, a point my learned friend made made to the judge. Um, well, even, even if um, um, Section 12 is in play in this statutory scheme, um, it doesn't help because, look, there's no there's only a power to issue a report which on my on the, on the ombudsman's case can be exercised um, more than once uh, and there's no power to revoke a report um, um, to which we said and, and the judge agreed that it's implicit in the in the implied power to uh, uh, to issue a report on more than one occasion that you must also have Are we talking about powers or duties here? Because section 30, subsection 1, talks about the local commissioner completing an investigation. He shall prepare a report, which sounds more like a duty than a power. Um, yes, yeah, so um, <clears throat> it's a little there isn't a straightforward answer to that question. I'm Sorry. Um, no, no, no. I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, I was going to come to it in due course anyway. If you look at page 713 mm -hmm. in bundle 3, um, section 30, um, if, a, if a local commissioner completes an investigation of a matter, he shall prepare a report. But then section 31b, if after the investigation of the of the matter is completed, the commissioner decides he's satisfied with the action the authority he considers uh, concerned have taken or proposed to take, and not appropriate to prepare and send a copy of the report, he may instead prepare a statement of reasons. So that so there isn't a duty to issue a report. There's a duty to either issue a report or a statement of reasons, depending on what the ombudsman has concluded in the investigation. And one of the things that we say, and jump, jump the gun a little bit, is that the is that the power to adopt a statement of reasons is very clearly one which which ought to be capable of being reviewed, because um, um, one of the triggers for adopting the statement of reasons is the ombudsman is satisfied with action which the authority proposes to take. Now, if a statement of reasons is adopted rather than a report being issued on that basis, and the authority doesn't take the action which which it had proposed to take, then we say it, it would plainly be uh, the the most uh, plainly would have been intended that the ombudsman could revisit his statement of reasons and say, well, now I, I I'm going to proceed to a report. So it's just an, an example of how of a power slash duty of, of equivalent status to the to the to the issuing of a of a report where where one can see there would be very good sense in the ombudsman being able to revisit it. But they would be different powers in, the, in, in your example. Um, well the, the You wouldn't be exercising the same power twice. Reasons first, then a report. That is true, yes, yes. But but a, but a but a power to to, to revoke. Um, a statement of reasons or to um, 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 to revisit the decision to adopt a statement of reasons and then proceed to a report instead. 
So, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to, to be diverted away from my lady's question of what is it in section 12 which um, does what I say it does. Um, um, the effects of section 12 say is and can only be um, to deem to deem the exercise of a power or the performance of duty not to exhaust that power, that duty in the in the in the relevant case, subject to the contrary theory, um, um, without section twelve, it might be considered that that uh, um, once you've done something once in a particular case, um, then the the duty is exhausted or the power is 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 exhausted. Um, I make that submission with some hesitation because it was the judge's view, and it's a fair view from the authorities, that the arguments around the statutory scheme in this case are the same whether you're applying Section 12 or not. Uh, most of the authorities don't apply Section 12. Um, we've got Mr Justice Fordham in the Dickens, I'm sorry, in the Johnson case who does, who does <coughs> it, uh, and, and we say rightly so. But um, um, in the majority of the authorities, the court is considering whether a power to revoke a particular decision can be implied from the statutory scheme without making express reference to Section 12. You might expect Section 12 to feature more in the reasoning of the court if it has the effect that you say it does. Well, it is. Uh, Yes, one one could say that, but but one also doesn't find any any case where it's cited, and um, the court says no. Um, yeah, well, it's not, <laughs> not applicable. There might be anyway. All right. <coughs> um, but as I, as I said, we we put our case firstly on on the basis of section twelve, but then said even even, even without it. Um, it's still a, a question of statutory construction. Um, um, is, there, is there an implied power to um, revoke or retake a particular decision or, or not? Um, and I, I say, I say, it, it was also the judge's view that, that Section Twelve didn't particularly matter. Um, she expressed that view in her reasons for refusing permission to appeal. Page 166 of the core bundle. Um, the I, was I was a little bit suspicious about text based practice reasoning. I mean, the, the reasons for the judgment are, the, are in the judgment, aren't they? But also, it, do, it does matter, doesn't it? Because uh, the Ombudsman only has such powers as are conferred by statute. There's no, it's not like a court where it can provide some inherent jurisdiction to do something. So one has got to find the source for the powers. Uh, and it, it's one thing to say, well, there's nothing in the statute that says you can't. But if there's power under Section 12, there's certainly no contrary intention. It's another thing to say, well, we can find some power by going through the, the relevant statutory provisions that govern the, the, the function in question and say, well, it must be implicit in that. Those are two quite different things. Well, well Lord, you say that, but that is what is, in fact has happened in the majority of the cases in the, that you have in the bundle. I think we, we, uh, between us we've, we've looked at uh, all of the Punctus cases. I mean, they're, they're, the Punctus cases mainly concern courts and tribunals. They, 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 they don't very often concern uh, administrative bodies. Um, but in, in cases like um, Trustees of the Lake District, like Lisa, like Everett, uh, like Persimmon, um, like Dickens, um, um, the, the the issue is considered as a question of statutory construction without without express regard to, to Section Twelve. Um, so I think so. I think my third principle was Section Twelve. My fourth principle was. Um, it's a question of statutory interpretation even without Section 12. My 
my fifth principle is that even if on um, um, a fair reading of the statutory scheme an authority is not able to um, um, revoke or retake a particular decision, it will not be functus in all circumstances and for all purposes because of the recognised exceptions to functus issue, um, in particular fraud and fundamental mistake of, of fact. Um, recognised as exceptions most recently in San Botin, uh, tab 9, paragraph 3. Um, the Ombudsman yeah. has has exercised a jurisdiction to review reports and statements of reasons on grounds of error of fact uh, for quite some time. Um, the, uh, the judge referred to this in her in her judgment at paragraph 84, and you've got the policy of the Ombudsman on page 148 of the of the supplementary bundle. Um, Sorry, what parent number was that of the judgment? So it's paragraph uh, 84 of the judgment. Thank you. Sorry, which, which refers to 148 of the supplementary bundle. Now, my lord asked my learned friend, well, what's the juridical basis for the, for the exceptions to Funkus and SEO? And um, um, Finally, my final principle, and perhaps my, perhaps my final point for today, is what we say, and I, I, something the court should bear in mind in approaching <coughs> the, um, the interpretation of the statutory scheme, which is the, um, the modern constructive approach to judicial review, whereby um, Public bodies are encouraged um, to uh, look seriously at um, threats of judicial review proceedings, pre-action protocol letters, <coughs> and to um, to reconsider their decisions in in appropriate cases. Um, I think my lady uh, said something to that effect or on those lines in the Kalonga. Case um, tab seventeen paragraph eighty one. Um, I think you were you were considering um, instances where local authorities didn't have an express statutory power to uh, to revisit the decision, but um, um, did so in the face of a of a of a. But I think I rationalised that by reference to. Provisions like section 111 of the Government Review Act and yep. so on. So it's a slightly different point. Yep. Well, um, if it's section 111 of the, of the 1952 Act, that, of course, is a, is a statutory embodiment of common law principles that the Ombudsman would be, would be subject uh, in any event. Um, I, think, I, think, I think you also referred to section 222 of the Local Government Act 1972, oh, no, power, power to representation. But, the, but the, the point remains, and I'll, and I'll be submitting further tomorrow, that in particular in the case of, a, of a, uh, 
an actor who is who, who strives to have an informal um, process um, um, that there is very good sense in in that actor being able to review his decisions in the light of um, threat and judicial review proceedings rather than having to uh, to go to court um, uh, for them to be um, to be quashed or um, <coughs> Or anything can be done. Um, so that's my final principle. Um, tomorrow morning, then I will look at the judge's um, factors that she drew out of the statutory scheme in paragraph seventy-four, and then her application of those factors to the, this particular statutory scheme. Um, and and I will look at the uh, Dyer case and the other. <coughs> Very good. All right, we're 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 on track to finish by one o'clock tomorrow. <coughs> All right, ten thirty. Tomorrow.